Good morning, everybody. Take a look at this. A uh, little experiment to kick off straight away. Could you please raise your hand if you know to what this picture refers? It's something very famous known around the world. Raise your hands, please. How many have we got? Two. OK, thank you. Then take a look at this. Has anybody seen these? Two of you have, huh? OK, OK, two more. So let's go back and have a look at the first one again. Take a look at that. And take a look at my picture. So what, this is what I'm going to look at this morning. You can have a, a single thing, a single object, which will mean different things to different people, depending on your knowledge. Have a look at the guy who did the dogs. Edward Mybridge, an Englishman, lived in America for a long time. He was commissioned in 1877 by a wealthy man in California called Stanford to determine whether in a horse's gallop or canter there is any point where all four hooves are off the ground. Up to that point, uh, the human eye was not fast enough to catch it, to be able to see. And uh, artists very often painted horses with two feet out in front and two feet out at the back at the same time. Do they ever do that? No, they don't. Uh, if you have a look at that one, that's the clearest point. Yes, there is a point in the gate where all four hooves are off the ground. So my bridge is particularly interesting because these photographs are simultaneously scientific. It's about information, trying to find something out, and they are artistic. Artists and designers and people have used MyBridge all over the world, and uh, I find them particularly beautiful, too. Give you another piece of information about MyBridge. He discovered that the child his wife was carrying was not his, and he found the man responsible, went into his room, said, uh, good evening, Captain. Here is the answer to the letter you sent my wife. <laughs> Shot him dead. He was arrested, tried, and acquitted by a jury for justifiable homicide. Have a look at him again. Do you look at him differently now? <laughs> Information and knowledge changes the way we look at things, huh? All right, uh, let's have a very a lightning sketch of uh, children's literature and uh, the market for books. It's often been said uh, that the Victorians invented childhood. Up until, let's say, about 1850, kids were essentially small adults. Uh, they wore adult clothing in tiny sizes. And they went to work by the age of five, up chimneys, getting paid next to nothing and risking their lives. And by the end of the 19th century and the Edwardian decade, the first decade of the 20th, it was common for the middle classes to have um, a nursery, a room in the house, which is especially for children, to play in and to read in and to learn in which is a million miles from the Dickensian life of a child. So there was a very rapid change. The development of the Industrial Revolution and the British Empire and of printing technologies. So that you have, let's say roughly by 1900, a children's book market in Britain and in many other countries. Uh, here we can see two girls reading. Now, clearly, we should not be teaching girls to read. It merely uh, spoils them for marriage. Uh, there are people in the world who still think that. And uh, it is my belief that we should, uh, by all peaceful means, persuade them that they are wrong and that education should be given equally to all peoples of the world female and male. The type of education is up for discussion because everyone has a different view. But 
The fact that there are people who actively seek to obstruct the education of girls and women must be fought. Malala Yousafzai from Pakistan at the age of 14 for fighting for education for girls she was shot in the head. Now, I am an Englishman and uh, I must say I am proud that Britain took her and took care of her, gave her medical treatment and refuge. And she is now world famous. This is her in the White House because she is a young woman of extraordinary courage and uh, is an example to us all. My mother was Australian, and here's an interesting language point. My, uh, she died three years ago. Do I say my mother was Australian or she is Australian? Language doesn't always uh, fit the world. It's an interesting thought. She was Australian. We grew up with this book, uh, Cole's Funny Picture Book. Talk about the development of the market. You also had the development of uh, the commercial pressuring of children. Aggressive marketing. So, I want Cole's Funny Picture Book. Johnny Smith's got one. And I'm Johnny Smith. I've got Cole's Funny Picture Book. I'm so glad. Uh, Makes you want to punch him in the face, doesn't it, that expression? <laughs> we should think carefully about what is acceptable. Uh, there's a great deal of marketing in the world today which is unacceptable. Uh, aggressive manipulation of children's wishes. Uh, now I was born in the early 60s, and for me, children, generally speaking, should do what they're told. And uh, it's only when you get older that you should be granted the full rights of an adult. And I find all over the place nowadays that children have got adults wrapped around their fingers. Oh, what, you know, the kids say, what, what do you want? What do you want? And you have, you have to ask, the, you, the parents ask the child, is it all right if I do that? You don't say, is it all right? You say, Johnny, we're going. Ah, we should be thinking about that, especially if they look like that. <laughs> All right, I'm going to look at four books very quickly, very famous books, classics, uh, to look at different types of two levels that exist. It might be humor, it might be intellectual thought, it might be tone or wit. There are different kinds of two levels. So let's look very quickly at four very famous books. Lewis Carroll. Uh, writer of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass and winner of first prize for the funkiest hairstyle for men in the 19th century. This is a self-portrait. He was a photographer. Illustrated by uh, Sir John Tenniel. Beautiful drawings. You can't quite see, but this little uh, bottle of liquid has a label on it that says, Drink Me. And this has become very famous. It's often quoted by artists and illustrators. I've done so myself. Uh, the, a child might find that curious. It doesn't say, drink this. Drink me. So the bottle itself has spoken. And that might just make a child think, oh, that's a bit odd. Uh, an adult finds it witty. Wit is the combination of humor and intelligence. And uh, it's a wonderful world. And uh, in general, children, it's not available to children. But it is to adults. I don't think I read the whole book as a child, but we had them in the house. And I certainly looked through them, looked at the pictures a lot. And as a child, and even today, I find some of the pictures somewhat nightmarish. This is very odd. It's happening in what's described as a little dark shop. I mean, that's getting weird for starters. And the person serving you behind the counter is a sheep. 
the room becomes flooded. There are bushes and trees. The external world is inside a shop. And you're rowing a boat with a weird sheep. I found it somewhat disturbing, and I still do. I wonder, I'm not sure how children respond today. Um, kids have nightmares. But uh, as with most things, their response is fairly, well, it may be deep, but they don't know how to articulate it. Adults have had decades of nightmare, and they respond to it in a very different fashion. The second book, Through the Looking Glass, uh, the plot of it is based on a chess game. Lewis Carroll was a mathematician at Oxford, a man of intelligence and intellect. As a child, I saw this page and I kind of grasped, okay, so the, the, the characters in the book, which include the Red King and the Red Queen and la la la, the, what happens to them in the story is based on these moves but I never bothered to match them, and I still haven't. But presumably, they do match. At the end of this book, there's an interesting scene. Um, Alice is holding the Red King uh, of, uh, from a chess set. And uh, she comes out of this wacky world at the very end, and she's talking with her cat, as you do, and wonders if everything that's happened in the book was her dreaming, or whether what happened to her was in the dream of the Red King. Now, this is very close to the famous story uh, by Lao Tzu, the Taoist philosopher about the butterfly. You dream that you're a butterfly, you wake up, and you're not sure if you dreamt that or if the butterfly dreamt it was you. This is a profound philosophical question. You put that in front of a child, they're going to think, uh, well, most children will just find it a bit odd and pass on. You will get an occasional child who will think, hmm, this is a central philosophical problem of human existence. Hmm? Uh, I think I was one of those. A. A. Milne author of uh, the Winnie the Pooh books. A humorist, essayist, born in London, and one of the funniest writers for kids there has ever been. Uh, I read these to my wife a few years ago and could barely get through it for laughing. But I will try. I'd like to read you a little passage. Can you see the pig? Piglet is my favorite. And, uh, and generally speaking, I'm rather against merchandise, but I must confess, I do own a little piglet. And he lives on our bed. So here we go. Uh, the piglet lived in a very grand house in the middle of a beech tree, and the beech tree was in the middle of the forest, and the piglet lived in the middle of the house. Next to his house was a piece of broken board which had Trespassers W on it. When Christopher Robin asked the piglet what it meant, he said it was his grandfather's name and had been in the family for a long time. Christopher Robin said you couldn't be called Trespassers W and piglet said yes, you could because his grandfather was and it was short for Trespassers Will, which was short for Trespassers William. And his grandfather had had two names in case he lost one, Trespassers after an uncle and William after Trespassers. Now, <laughs> Golden rule is never explain a joke, right? But uh, here we go. What Milne is doing is very clever. The sign originally said, trespassers will be prosecuted. A child may have come across that. They may have not done so. Adults know about it. And the confusion is around the word will. We, as an adult, we know what it originally meant. But the child has heard that Will is short for William, and there is a confusion. And in the confusion, there is amusement. The drawings are by Ernest Shepherd, who lived for a time very close to where I live now, in a wonderful house in a beautiful little village. Interesting man, Ernest Shepherd. He was awarded the Military Cross in the First War. Had a long life, uh, with, uh, illustrated a great number of books. 
Ernest Shepard, check him out if you're interested. There are lots of new words in A.A. Milne's writings, uh, neologisms. Uh, elephants are called heffalumps. And in my family, they always have been. I was raised calling them heffalumps, and I still call them heffalumps. And uh, you don't go on an expedition, you go on an expedition. And you don't organize, you organize. And when you're a little bit hungry at 11 o'clock or at 4 o'clock, it's time for a little smackerel of something. They all come from this book. I am a bear of very little brain. You heard that? From this book. And it's, many of these uh, expressions have passed into the English language. Piglet. It's a hilarious drawing. Huh? You, you see the back of his head with his little ears and his hip sticking up? This um, economy is a... Uh, Something worth achieving in drawing, and Shepard was terrific at it. Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, Le Petit Prince, The Little Prince, is uh, one of the best-selling books of all time. It is a fable. It's commonly called a fable. It is marketed as a children's book, but it is the classic example of a book that's functioning on at least two levels. To the adult, it remains uh, profound, enigmatic, and repays repeated rereading. The child takes it as something slightly magical, slightly strange, uh, slightly beautiful. It's a little golden-haired boy. And the adult can think about it for a lifetime. He was a pilot. He was involved in the early years of commercial aviation, flying uh, Paris-Dakar, Dakar-Buenos Aires, and to Saigon. He has written uh, several beautiful books about flying for adults. So if you're interested in him, if you only know this book, read the adult books. They are beautifully written. All right, let's have a look at a few examples. Um, the little prince lives on a tiny planet. And at one point, he talks about the fact that uh, there are baobab trees. The baobab is a tree that you find in Africa and in Australia. And in this book, Exupery has decided that the baobab represents a kind of evil. I don't know why he chose that. They're beautiful trees, but uh, he did. And the little prince says, as soon as you see a shoot, you've got to dig it out quick. Or well, before you know it, they will have strangled the planet. Now, the book was published in 1943 in New York. A child may not know, but any adult who's had the remotest scrap of education will know that the Second World War was going on and that Europe was in the grip. In 1943, the war was beginning to turn, Stalingrad. But the future of Europe was still very much in peril, in the grip of fascism. So quite clearly, it's a warning. The rose is very enigmatic in the story. The little prince cares for the rose, but the rose seems to be, uh, what should we say, <coughs> petulant, uh, not easily pleased. And it's been widely suggested that the rose represents Saint Exupéry's wife, Consuelo Sunsin, from uh, El Salvador. Their marriage was, to put it mildly, tempestuous. There are a bunch of very interesting adults. Uh, I've got a list of them here. The king, the conceited man, the drunk, the businessman, the lamplighter. The text pokes fun quite often at the adult world, uh, as if the author is speaking directly to children and saying, we all know that adults are crazy, don't we? Yeah. The king likes to give orders and to be obeyed. There is an explicitly biblical dimension. Today in Britain, uh, you're much less likely to be raised a Christian than you were in the past. 
Britain is multicultural and multi-faith. Uh, you may be raised as a Muslim, as a Hindu, as a Jain, all sorts of things, as an atheist. Even if you're raised as an atheist, I would hope that you would have an acquaintance with the world's religions, which are um, a great store of knowledge and thought and uh, compassion. I have no faith, but I'm very interested in faith in principle and in other people's faith, and I am open to the idea that people of faith know something that I don't. Maybe they do. I won't tell you what happens in case you haven't read it, but uh, the little prince arranges a rendezvous with a snake. If that ain't biblical, I don't know what is. <laughs> to the Jansen from Finland. Uh, we've looked at three examples by men. If we take uh, this, a rational survey of the world's most famous children's books, uh, Men predominate. Why is that? Well, there are multiple reasons. Tove Janssen is a fine example of a superb artist, painter, illustrator, writer, for children and for adults. A long life. As a young woman, she was, well, even later, stylish. But as a young woman, look at that, tremendous poise. Poise is... Uh, a phenomenon that interests me. Poise is confidence based on a certain amount of knowledge. Not pride and not um, high-handedness or big-headedness, just poise. She had it. The Moomin Troll books she's most famous for and in many of her books, explicitly in uh, Moomin Valley in November, which was the last book in this series that she wrote, there is a deep strain of melancholy. Now, children don't really know what melancholy is. They know what sadness is. They know what unhappiness is. But melancholy is really the combination of um, sadness and a sort of aesthetic dimension. It's very adult, and much of the world's poetry is steeped in this idea of uh, wistfulness, of sadness without sitting on a doorstep crying your eyes out. And Tove Jensen has it in spades. This is a character called Toft, I think it is. He's found a wonderful little place to sleep. And you look at the gaze. The gaze is dreamy, out of focus, sort of looking into the mid-distance. Beautiful. I talked about nightmare in uh, Lewis Carroll's work. There is a certain amount of weirdness in Tove Janssen's characterization. The Moomin Trolls, generally, uh, this is the snork maiden, female, but Moomin Troll looks like that without the fringe. Uh, but there are many different types of character, very different physically. The other one is called a filly jonk, and as a child I found them weird. That the characterization is very odd. A big chunky pearl necklace, weird snout, black rings around the eyes, Kind of weird for kids. Not just that, the entire atmosphere of that picture, again, is rather dreamlike, bordering on nightmare. Just add a little aside there. Human life, it seems to me, is very much like that. Uh, the world is a very dangerous place. And it seems at the moment to be in a particularly violent state. Admittedly, we're not in the middle of the Second World War. But very often there's a sense that life is both uh, unimaginably beautiful and wonderful. And it's 
a hair's breadth away from teetering into nightmare. All right. Ten minutes to gallop through uh, the tick and talk books. Um, I have used some of those devices. The dimension of the intellect, uh, I strive for wit, humor. Uh, so let's go through the books one by one and just look at a couple of examples. Where is the world? The idea of world is a very adult thing. When we're born, the, the crying babe has no sense of self as distinct from world. As the baby develops and as the child develops and acquires language, and if you're interested in philosophy, this is a key point, when we have language and we can say world and self, then they're separate. And we can look at the story of the Garden of Eden, for example. The tree of knowledge. Once you know who I am, you're booted out of the garden. Which is an interesting thought. So, uh, a very simple device. There's a door that says the world, and in they go. Well, what's that? Where is it? What is it? Let's go and find out. Again, if you're an adult, the biblical reference here, there are three nails in this tree. The biblical reference is pretty clear. There should be a fourth nail for the notice, but in place of that, because there isn't room, we have a little bird. The child may or may not see that. Second book is The Storm. This one, in fact, I wrote before the first. And uh, it's not full of allusion and reference. It's a very simple fable. But there are little bits here and there, which um, if you look bottom left, that is the cover of the first book. Self-reference is a game that many artists and designers and writers use. A refers to B, and B refers to A, and round and round and round you go. Book three um, explicitly alludes to many areas of human thought and uh, inquiry. That hill, I used to live below that hill. If you find out about illustrators, you'll often be able to see that uh, they drew literally upon their environment to make their pictures, particularly landscape. I know two people, a good friend of mine and a famous illustrator called William Heath Robinson, whose female figures are clearly derived from their wives. Good friend of mine, Chris Riddell, famous illustrator. I'm not sure he's even aware of it, but the women look like his wife. Not his partner, his wife. I don't know what you think about that. I am a husband and I have a wife and will remain so until I kick the bucket. She is not my partner, she is my wife because I married her and she married me. Of course, if you want to go for partner, that's your choice, but I've got my choice too. Uh, the room of words. I've been interested in language uh, for most of my life. My parents were interested in language and got me interested. Uh, all sorts of scripts here. We have uh, cuneiform, Egyptian hieroglyphs, including one of Tok. We have Phoenician and Hebrew, ancient Greek, uh, Latin. Verbum sapienti sat est. A word to the wise is enough. So I know X, and you know X, and I know that you know X, so all I have to do is say X, and you get it. If I know X, and you don't know X, I go X, and you go, huh? It's a question of uh, shared language. These are Mayan, Central America, 
Celtic ruins. This is a script from Africa. This one I made up. It's called copyright. <laughs> now, there's a little gag here. There's a sign that says, Gum ji joy dei seong se ji. No writing on the floor. We can see that the dog has read it and is looking at the boy, and we can see that the boy hasn't read it. He doesn't know what it means. You find this very commonly in pictures, in literature, in film, in theater. The audience knows that this person knows that, and that that person doesn't know that, and that that person knows that that person doesn't know, and da 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 da. You get this situation developing. At one point, tick gets turned into a knight. When I was a boy, I was crazy for knights. I still am, although if you stop and think about it, they're just thugs in metal, really. They go around killing people. But the romance of it was, ah, I loved it. And Tok uh, is enlarged and functions as a horse. And uh, they encounter an enormous fire-breathing dragon called Samantha. Two trees. Cognitio and Vita, the tree of knowledge and the tree of life. Where would you find those? The adult may know, the child most probably does not know. On Tick's Lance, there's another label that says Sapere Aude, which is Latin, meaning dare to know. And it is the great cry of the 18th century enlightenment in Europe. Atheist. The cry is, do not be afraid. Take the light of reason, shine it upon the world, and understand. Now, that suits me, because I'm an atheist. But as I said before, people of faith consider faith also to be a light. And I share the world with them. And it is incumbent upon all people of goodwill to get along with each other. It's terrible strife in the world because people are sure they're right. I'm an atheist. I may be wrong. Fourth book, The Secret of the Universe. Um, this was a rather brave decision from the publisher to accept this as a cover. I don't think it helped to sell the book particularly. But uh, I thought it was good. The eye is a very common symbol for consciousness, awareness. You have a rock sitting on the floor and nothing is looking at it. You have a rock sitting on the floor and an eye looking at it, and the situation is different. There is awareness. Greek myth. I was brought up with the Greek myths as a child. My mother read them to me. The book was in the house. Greek myth is one of the foundation stones of Western culture. And if you have a Western education, actually, in many places not today, because there are many problems with education today. In the past, you were raised with this language. So that if I meet you, I say, yes, of course, well, you know, that's Pegasus. And they say, yeah, of course. You all know. Pegasus, the flying horse. Once again, if you don't know, you don't know. OK, no, it's not your fault. Ah. Did I mention about ignorance? Maybe I didn't. Did I say at the beginning that ignorance is no shame? I, don't th I did say that, did I? No, no. Oh, I didn't say that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> ignorance uh, is no shame. There are millions of things I don't know. When did the Chenlong Emperor die? I don't know. Tell me. And I'm not afraid to tell you I don't know. Willful ignorance is shameful. Many people say, uh, who needs books? Who needs learning? Get out there. Make money. 
have fun before you kick the bucket. Well, that's all right, but um, it never was good enough, and in today's world, it is even more not good enough because the world is in peril. We now have the technology to entirely wreck the place, the whole place. So the duty now is greater than it ever has been to get along with each other, to cooperate, and to learn. It doesn't follow, but I think that in general, if you are well-educated in the broadest possible sense, it's less likely that you're going to shoot an aircraft out of the skies. Dreadful, dreadful thing over Ukraine. The people who did that may have a justifiable cause in the politics of their country. They have no justification to do such a thing. And I think if, broadly speaking, if the world strives to educate itself, it's much less likely that they will do something like that. Dr. Quill, he lives at the top of a very tall tower. Uh, I'm not a wealthy man, but if I ever become one, I will build a very tall tower out of stone, and I will live at the top in a room like that, Tick and Tock uh, go and visit him, and Dr. Quill says, yeah, what are you doing? And they says, well, we're looking for the secret of the universe. And he says, ah, I am looking for the secret of the universe. It's all mine. I'm going to get there first. It's mine. I'm going to get there first. You can't have it. And he kicks them out. Now, this is a general principle of knowledge. Uh, if you are fortunate enough to have been educated and to have knowledge, share it. Generously, with everyone. That doesn't mean talk to people when they don't want to hear, but, you know, I mean, be, be generous. Knowledge is not something uh, to be proud of or to use as a weapon against other people. Knowledge is a gift, and, um, as I just said, stands to help human beings to live together peacefully. The fifth book, uh, Sirens. Tick and Tock end up in a city, and they are separated. And uh, you see Tock is appearing there as a kind of icon, a logo. I'll look at, uh, in one minute at why that is. At one point, Tick finds himself in what looks like a giant cathedral, but it's not used for worship. It's full of children playing video games. Now. I be have become increasingly opinionated about the education of children, uh, in part because I don't have any. So it's easy for me to speak. But I mean, I like a game. I wasted a certain amount of my youth playing pool, playing cards. You know, a little game here and there is fine, no problem. Playing video games for four or five hours a day is a problem. And in Many levels, on many levels. You are not in a community. Well, you may be in an online game community, but you're not with the people you're living with. You're not learning. You're not outside. You're not running. You're not learning about the outside world. Now, I accept that gaming can do all those things. It's just that most of it doesn't. And it's rather like the television. A great deal of gaming and the TV is a child management strategy. Go away and leave me in peace for two hours. Well, that is not a wise way to raise children. 12-12. The aisle is 12-12. Anybody recognize that number? Okay, the Children's Crusade, which is a fascinating episode in Europe. If you're interested, look it up. It's so easy these days. 500 years ago, if you wanted to know what the Children's Crusade was, you would have to go and find a monk, probably. Now, anyone online has it in five seconds. Tremendous opportunity. In this city, there's a nasty man. Uh, 
who runs the whole place and has cameras everywhere. I'm not quite sure what the situation is in Hong Kong, but in Britain it's certainly the case. If you leave your house and you're not in the woods, the chances are you're on camera. Surveillance is a very serious problem, question. A lot of crime is solved because of CCTV. That's the principal argument. And a lot of people don't know how to behave. But is being on camera, is that an all right price to pay? Something we should all be thinking of, about. Lots of different languages. There's a terrible sort of sweet substance. It's not really food, it's just chemical gunk, which they feed the kids. It's called kemituk. Kemituk. Ushindi is Swahili for victory. Make new and vend is a slogan. In the Second World War, the slogan was make do and mend. In today's world, you don't repair your clothes, you throw them away and buy a new one. To this day, not all the time, but from time to time, I sew buttons on, I fix holes. It's ridiculous, the, the, the entire garment is fine, it's all right. You just got a hole here and you chuck it away. First of all, what's wrong with a hole? Uh, I don't mind. Secondly, if you really don't want to wear a garment that's been repaired, repair it and give it to somebody who needs it. Uh, Thinking is bad for your health. There are people out there, powerful people, who think that way and wish to preserve their power over us by that sort of uh, sloganing thinking. Back to this. That one. We now see the reason that Tok was photographed. He was photographed so that the images could be used as logos and slogans to sell terrible food and terrible drink to children. The consumption of food in the West is appalling. Tremendous wealth, tremendous waste, and in many instances, dreadful food production. The food is not clean, it's not healthy, it's not fresh, it's full of terrible things. Do we have to live that way? No, we don't. I've got to wind this up. Uh, sixth book, Smoke. We come across three of the world's great spiritual leaders and a famous pilot. In fact, I don't call them spiritual leaders. They were people of insight and they spoke about their insight and they became famous. And other people established institutions. The people themselves did not start institutions. Other people did. Tick and Tock have become famous. This is the sixth book. You know, we've had five of them out, and uh, they're now super famous across the world. And they are chased by the paparazzi. Now, I have made very sure that I'm not famous, so I don't get chased by the paparazzi. But if I were, I'd have two choices. One is to punch them on the nose. Two is to stand there and say, listen, mate, would you like it if I chased you? Would you? And he'd say, well, well, no, I probably wouldn't, actually. Uh, or somebody might say, well, it's my job, mate. I've got to do my job. Well, that's not a sufficient argument. You cannot justify immoral acts because it's your job. That won't wash. Why do the paparazzi continue to do this? Because people buy the newspapers. If we stop buying the newspapers, those guys and girls will disappear. And three cheers for that. At one point, Tick and Tock end up in an aeroplane and it gets hit and it's going down. 
And because they hitched a ride, there's only one parachute. And the pilot says, you have it. And they say, no, 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 no. He forces it on them and throws them out. And the pilot goes down. Sacrifice is uh, an adult idea. And people sacrifice all sorts of things every day of the week, all around the world, for other people, for their children. The last book, North. They're still famous. At the end of book six, they get home and they find uh, they're not just being pursued by the paparazzi. The paparazzi have completely engulfed their home. So they can't go there. And they decide to head north because where it's cold, you might have fewer people. And they go north and north and north, looking for somewhere where they can live in peace. Whaling is something I've been enormously interested in ever since I was a child. I had, and still have, a beautiful book called Seabird, which is about the history of uh, 19th century whaling out of Nantucket and New Bedford in America. I'm against whaling. They are the most beautiful creatures. We should not kill them. But equally, we cannot deny the tremendous drama and even romance of 19th century whaling. Moby Dick is the best book I've ever read. If you haven't read it, give it a shot. The best novel I've ever read. The most beautiful thing. Both interesting from a point of view of whaling history and deeply uh, mystical. A wonderful book. A child won't have, well, no, most likely will not have heard of Moby Dick. It's not a short book, and these days long books are less and less read because people have lost patience. I have lost patience, I must confess. At one point, Tick describes uh, the ideal place. You know, they're running away from the paparazzi. Where would you like to be that would be the best possible? And he describes a beautiful little valley with woods and trees and a little stream. As a kid, I would love such a landscape. Oh, look, you can climb up the little hill and get up the tree and dive down there and da-da-da-da-da. It's a sort of playground. As an adult, you may have a, a larger sense of what that means because you will have had bad experiences and pressures and troubles. And then a place like this becomes a sort of Arcadia, uh, a dreamed of golden place from the past. Of course, 10,000 years ago, human life was not like that. To live in a place like that is very harsh, just to get enough food. But human beings like to dream of a time in the past when humans and nature were in harmony. Apart from certain sort of hunter-gatherer type situations, 20, 30 people, I think they can live in harmony with the Earth. We are now blatantly out of harmony with the Earth. And if we don't change the way we live, it'll all be over. The whole show will be over. Much like this. Last slide. This is a picture from Seabird, the book I just mentioned to you about whaling. As a child, I was really thrilled by this picture, thrilled and frightened. The boy has a, a seabird made of walrus ivory. And at one point, it drops over the ship's side and plummets down into the sea. And he loves it so much, he goes straight in after it and dives down. And uh, I was raised in Hong Kong, and we used to swim a lot, both at the swimming pool and at the beaches. And I had experience of going down, and the sense of excitement and fear, and of less and less light, getting darker, and, ooh, what's down there? Is something going to bite me? Da, 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 da. Now, in this case, he's retrieving something he's lost. But I think we can take this more generally as an image of uh, searching, striving. I think in general, human beings should strive. In fact, we have to strive. 
and not just for the welfare of your family. Of course, everyone has a duty to their family, or if they don't have a family, they have a duty to themselves, to, to everyone you know, you have a duty. We should be striving for more than the welfare of our closest circles. We should be striving for the welfare of all humanity and indeed for all life. And that requires effort, but it's worth it because if you put in the effort, your life is richer and everybody's life is richer. So we should be going deeper and deeper and wider and wider and higher and higher. And we will now do that. <laughs> May I ask Mei Fung to come up? And we will have a chat. Mei Fung is, uh, thank you. Uh, Mei Fung is an independent uh, art and culture worker. And we're going to have a little chat, discuss some of these ideas, and then we'll throw the floor open and uh, questions will be very welcome. Okay. So we. Hello? Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen this leaflet. It seems that uh, we haven't really introduced you. Have ah. we? <laughs> okay. So uh, other than being a, so other than being a uh, professionally a, an illustrator, mm -hmm. so actually you did all those the. Uh, 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 drawings in your, for the Tick and Talk uh, series. Yes. Yes. Okay. So other than being an illustrator, Peter is also uh, a musician, uh, a performer, and uh, also, well, of course, a writer. Okay. And uh, and uh, actually, I I got to know Peter several years ago. Uh, I watched some of a few actually, one or two, of his uh, uh, multimedia musical performances in Hong Kong. And uh, also, I, I read, you know, his Stick and Talk series. So I hope that, uh, uh, also we did talk a little. So mm. I hope that, that we can have a good dialogue today. Mm. Okay, sure. so before we go into other roles of you, you know, mm -hmm. uh, we try to go back to Tick and Talk. Uh, actually, how do you come up with Tick and Talk, these two protagonists for these seven books of yours? Okay. May, I hope you don't mind if I answer to the audience. Is, is that all right? Okay. Yes, happy with yeah, that? okay. Yeah. Um, I had a, I still have a little dog who looks like that. <laughs> I was given it when I was five. It was bought by an aunt of mine who was going through a certain unhappiness and uh, I believe she was in a hospital. And there was a fair at the hospital, and somebody had made soft toys, and she bought a white one for me and a pink one for my sister. I'm a twin. So I had this little dog as a boy, and uh, come 2001 or something, I think it was, uh, I decided to write some children's books, in part because the market for adult illustration books is tiny. People just don't do it anymore. The great exception is the Folio Society in London, which I'll be giving a talk about tomorrow afternoon at PMQ, if anybody's interested. Uh, they commission the illustration of uh, adult fiction. But in general, there's just no work. So if you want to make any kind of living as an illustrator, then children's books is one of the ways to do it. So uh, I decided, uh, I can't quite remember why or how, but mm -hmm. I just fixed on the dog and uh, invented a boy. Each is in some respect, uh, has something of me in it. But in general, the dog is wise. <laughs> wise and uh, somewhat enigmatic. He generally says things from a distance whereas the boy is much more in the human world, uh, suffering all the pressures that we do in life. Uh, and one book followed another. They started, books one and two are pretty obviously children's books. 
starting from book three, and most certainly by uh, five, six, seven, I dropped all pretense that they were for children. Uh, they are, but more seriously, the, for adults. But I still love the form. The children's book form is a wonderful one because uh, it gives you a, a, an enormous area within which to deploy wit, which I touched on earlier, which is a sort of uh, knowingness. Knowingness is, you say something very simple, but in fact it means this, 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 this. And couching the whole thing in the children's book form, but really meaning all these other things, involves wit. So, even if I were in the position where I never had to work again, I would still choose the children's book form. Mm -hmm. um, but for adults. Pardon? But for adults. <laughs> yes. But, well, for both. For both. And um, the two-levelness is, is in itself a, a charming form. Mm -hmm. Well, just a minor thing. Mm. It's about uh, talk, mm. the dog. Uh, sometimes people mistake it, uh, mistake it as a rabbit. Yeah. You know, this, there is this kind of ambiguity, you know, yeah. in this little dog. Right. Why, why did you create such a kind of ambiguity? Right. I, I did not create the ambiguity. <laughs> <laughs> um, this this uh, appeared, every time a book came out, I would come back to Hong Kong and do some talks and stuff, and kids would come up and say, yeah, yeah, about the rabbit, is it, is it? And I, Johnny, it's a dog, okay? It's a dog. Uh, the ears are not very long. They're round. <laughs> um, so in the Black Book of Falling, which is the eighth book, the comic strip book, I referred to this. And people keep thinking, it's a wabbit, it's a wabbit. Uh, so it was not intended, but it's provided uh, the opportunity for some good fun. Yeah. Oh, okay. So uh, uh, there is also another observation for your, uh, for your tick and talk. Mm. Uh, practically, if I remember correctly, uh, there is no parent, there are no parents in it. Mm. But tick actually is just an uh, you know, adolescent or just a, <coughs> a, a child. Yeah, so I'm how come do you have no parents in it? It's a good question. Nobody's asked that. I've never asked myself. <laughs> uh, I think essentially you just accept a world. Ah. Um, so you actually didn't have any complex towards the parents? No, no, I got on very well with my parents. There are all sorts of, they're, they're both dead now. Um, that was a big threshold. Uh, fortunately for me, it happened very late in my life, but uh, as soon as both parents are gone, I, I have five brothers and sisters, so the family is large and there was always stuff going on, and, but when both parents are gone, Suddenly, what? Well, yeah, I did suddenly. The feeling was, um, well, poof, they've gone. It's just me now. No, oh, not just me and my wife and my brothers and sisters and friends and that, but um, it's a big change. But uh, I didn't think about it. And I think many children's books don't tackle the large, well, Winnie the Pooh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Christopher Robin's parents? Mm -hmm. Nowhere. Mm -hmm. Nowhere. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, I mean, in adult fiction, generally speaking, you do take care of this matter. Mm -hmm. But in kids' books, you're presented with an environment and you just accept it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, and also about the language. Mm -hmm. uh, reading this uh, several tick and talk, one pleasure is that it's, the words are very simple. Mm -hmm. And also have a lot of rhyme, you know, just like quite poetic in a way. Mm -hmm. But it's simple. But then there's the second level, mm. the intellectual side. So in a way, it satisfies the adults a lot. Um, how actually you, you think about the language that you use in, you know, in this uh, seven yeah. books? This is something I didn't realize as a young man. It took me a while to get to this. But you can use simple words to say very complex things. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Chinese is very powerful in this regard. 
四個字嗰啲咯，即係四字詞語啊。Four characters can express an immense amount of learning。係咪言簡意賅啊？我成日讀錯該字。你唔串人人串你。嚇 ！That is a very simple thing that I I you can't translate it. Roughly speaking, um, you may not manipulate and calculate other people, but they will regardless do it to you. And I haven't even translated that at all well. It would take me a minute, but the Chinese is boom. <laughs> Chinese is a, a very powerful language for using short forms to express wide and deep things. Mm -hmm. So, but the same goes for English. You mm -hmm. can use simple language. Mm -hmm. And some of the, the great philosophers have, I mean, I can read them. Mm -hmm. I know every single word, but the thought is deeply Deep complex. Profound. Yeah. So, um, but the reason I chose that form is that, uh, especially at the beginning, the, the children, the, it's, it's a children's book. Yeah. But as, as I've been saying, the, the two level thing yeah. applies using a very simple language. Actually, is it uh, you're getting more wordy and wordy? The they, get, they get wordier, yeah. they get longer. Yeah. And uh, if we keep going, they're going to end up being novels. Of <laughs> 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 okay. So, uh, well, Again, go back to the seven books. Mm. Uh, there are a lot of imaginations. Even though, based on your presentation, you did tell, I guess those were your inferences, isn't it, in a way? Some of the things I yeah, said, yes, the, indeed, yeah. yes. But then still, the, there is a lot of imaginations. For example, remember, you know, a tick and talk, uh, uh, having a, having a deep meal downstairs, and then there is a hole up there, and then they go up, and there is the yeah. sea, you know? Yes. So it's really beyond normal human beings' imagination. Yeah. How actually, how, how have you to do with imagination? How imagination comes to you? Okay, the, the, the example you gave is a very good one because as a child I read a book, I can't remember the name, but they go into the attic and they're in a world. Yeah, very uh, interesting. It's, yeah, uh, it's... In fantastic writing, whether it's for kids or adults, you need a mechanism. Either, either you start in the fantastic world and that's it, you accept it, or you start in our world, and then you need a device to get into it. Mm -hmm. So there's a door, you eat something, you go into the attic, the, you know, there are various devices to get you somewhere else. Mm -hmm. yeah? um, so, in the, generally speaking, uh, I have specific sources for these things, like I'd read a story oh, okay. with this So you thing. have references somewhere. Yeah, I do. Okay. But equally, there are, in the life of anybody who's doing imaginative work, there are sources that you're not clear about. To this day, I'm not clear about. If you want to look at it from a sort of psychological point of view, there are feelings and experiences in the past that are at work inside you the whole time and of which you are unaware. The subconscious, all, all these things. Um, I'm giving another talk tomorrow on color and uh, my experience as a child in Hong Kong to do with objects that I came across that have had an enormous impact on me, mm -hmm. both in terms of color and form and taste, mm -hmm. personal taste. I see. But, but uh, is there any obvious Hong Kong influence on you through these seven books? Um, I didn't. I think in Sirens, the fifth book, we're in a city, a very busy, noisy city. That's, that's Hong Kong. So, <laughs> <laughs> there, there may be something of that. Uh, okay. In many of them, the environments are to do with the English landscape. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, uh, let's go to the content mm. or the environment of your seven books. Um, they're mainly in the, in the wilderness, you know, in, in a world that's not contemporary. Mm -hmm. that, except perhaps for sirens, you know, you have uh, the video game stuff. Yep. But still, the depiction of the scenarios, not really present, not now. Mm. Yeah. Well, any, okay. any, any comment on that? Or? Yeah, well, I think I was raised with many of those books that I showed you. And um, there were books in the house. There was music in the house. So the world of culture and the arts was there from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, 
and of the imagination. Mm -hmm. But it was in my teenage years that I conspicuously became interested in fantasy fiction and fantasy illustration. And it's very obvious, in your teenage years are hard for most people, and they're especially hard for boys. This is a very interesting subject. Uh, women become women because something happens to them physically. Mm. And there's a certain amount of pain and blood. Boys don't. And partly for that reason, in many cultures around the world, there used to be initiation ceremonies in which you oh. hurt the boy. Yeah. You knock out a tooth, you put a scar, you put them in a cave for three days, you do something frightening to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't do that anymore. Nobody did it to me. Mm. I was not initiated into adult life. I, I don't wish to blame my parents. This, this was the, the norm. Nobody did. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying we should be knocking the teeth out of the, <laughs> the heads of children. We should be, somehow, boys have to be initiated. Mm. Now, I guess some fathers maybe are still doing this. Maybe they are. Um, if I had a son, what would I do? Well, I'd be playing tennis, I'd be riding a bike, I'd be swimming, I'd be going to the library, I'd be going to the movies, I'd be going for walks in the woods and saying, do you know what that bird is? Do you know what that tree is? I'd be doing all that. And I'm sure many fathers are, but many aren't. And... Uh, Actually, the, the most difficult thing about the teenage years is sexuality, and that you just have to deal with yourself. Uh, in fact, it would be thoroughly embarrassing if your father tried to help you with that, right? <laughs> so that is difficult. That's difficult for boys and for girls, and you just have to tough it out. It's hard. But teenage years are difficult, and one of the very common responses, as in my case, is to you go into a fantasy world. You go somewhere okay. else kind of escape? Or? Yes, a totally escape. Yes, escape, yeah. Totally. Now, um, I still do that to some extent. No? It's, yes, even today it's still in some, to some extent it's escape, but it's not only escape. It's the, the world of the imagination. Mm -hmm. And more consciously so, because I'm in my 50s now and it's, uh, I've been looking at art and making art for 35 years. I mean, after that, you kind of, <laughs> you should have learned something. Um, so what I'm saying is it's not simply unconscious escape, it's also conscious uh, exploration. Mm, yeah. Okay. Well, one last question mm. for the box before we okay. go to the floor. Uh, actually, um, you also do music and the performing arts. Mm. But for music, I have no comment, okay? But for the performing arts, uh, no, it's actually it's good, but it's uh, not, not... It's that bad, very, huh? Very experimental, you know? <laughs> yeah, you have really to engage yourself in it. But for, for, for the performances, yeah. uh, actually it's really very the oriental of course, you mm. know, very dark, mm. uh, full of melancholy, mm. and, um, you know, the talk about disease and all those things. Uh, but for the, the tick and talk, uh, no matter what, you know, uh, no matter what kind of adventures they have, they, they lead to a positive kind of ending, yeah. a kind of enlightenment for tick and talk. Mm -hmm. So uh, how, uh, why this difference in your performing art, uh, between your performing art and your uh, writing? Uh, yeah, your it's, it's a good question. Um, I am now considering a performance that's going to be like the kids' books. Really? Oh, you mean so the, the coming one? No, the one after that. Oh, okay. Four years away. Wow. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, um, there is a difference. Um, these are in part to do with charm. Charm? Charm. I, I, I want them to be charming uh -huh. and pleasing and uh, yeah, not, not too dark, not negative. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, yeah. there may be in nasty people, but yeah. broadly speaking, it's a positive experience. Right. When it comes to one-man performance on adult themes, then I'm going full out for how I see things. 
Can and I say your real self or kind of revelation? No, they're both, they're both real. real. Mm -hmm. They're both real, yes. Um, it's also a question of what's appropriate. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're putting stuff bef in front of children, it, it must be appropriate. Yeah. Um, but even in the adult work, which can be extremely dark, not twisted, but dark, uh, I've clarified this in, in many discussions, that if I make a one-man performance, it normally takes, nowadays, it takes two years to make. There's an enormous amount of reading. Performing, I mean, two minutes before curtain goes up is kind of agonizing, right? So the, there's a great deal that's gone into the thing. So that even if the content is very dark, and we're looking at terrible things that human beings do, or terrible disease, or whatever it is, the very fact that I have made the art object mm -hmm. is a positive act. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, so mm -hmm. sometimes we lose sight yeah, of that. Yeah, yeah, okay, the, uh, Well, you take the King Lear. I saw it recently, again. One of the great works of all time. People get killed left, right, and center. People betray each other. People act out of terrible selfishness. And at the end, partly because of the language, the poetry, right. and the tremendous craft, both of the playwright and the actors, at the end you still think, well, well human beings are not bad, huh? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so much so for me, all right? So uh, now let's open it to you all. Oh, okay. <laughs> so folks, okay. Okay, later on. Okay. Sorry. Yes, yes, go ahead. Oh. Uh, my question is about atheism. Yeah. Were you always an atheist, or did you have a religion? And if, if so, when and what caused you to move to atheism? Thank you. Um, my father was English, uh, and he, he used to describe himself as a pagan. Essentially, he was an atheist. From the east end of London. My mother was Australian. And she was sort of uh, <coughs> ambiguously Christian. No particular church affiliation. No thought out faith. Very general. As a child in Hong Kong, I was christened. I went to Sunday school. Uh, <laughs> um, and to this day, I have a great love of Christian art. I mean, my taste in art top of the list in music, in architecture, in painting, it's Christian. Just the most beautiful things. Uh, and the teachings of Jesus, beautiful, wonderful. Uh, I, so my point was that uh, there was a sort of vague faith in the house, but it wasn't, um, I didn't go to church regularly. There was a point when I was 13 I thought I'd read the New Testament and I started telling people I was a Christian. Just, I think, because I thought it was kind of cool, actually. <laughs> but uh, by the time I was 16, 17, I'd been thinking about things and uh, to me it didn't add up. And it became more and more clearly so across my working life. And uh, as I said, I may be wrong. But um, to me, the fundamental problem is that I do not see evidence of benevolence. Where was the benevolence in the Holocaust? Where was it for 300 people on a plane? And the, a common justification is that one way or another, we deserve it. Human beings have done bad things and you deserve it. I don't accept that, but even if I did accept that, I would come back to children. Children suffer atrociously around the world. They're innocent. I mean, they can be really cruel. Kids can be really cruel. But they're not um, responsible. Three-year-olds with dreadful illnesses. What's going on there? Even in the Bible, Jesus said, he who knows not of sin has not sinned. So 
Yeah, he who so knows how to sin. He, he who knows not of sin has ah. not sinned. Ah. Does he say that? Okay. That's a very interesting thought. Yeah. That's when, uh, uh, that's when, blind, when he healed blind Barnabas. All so, right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So that's just Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for the question. listening to you and uh, I keep saying to myself why is this guy so serious? I, I mean, you know, as an author or illustrator for children's books and, and uh, but that's not a question, it's my no, personal no. feeling. No, thank you. That's a uh, but uh, I'm more interested to ask you, um, you know, when, when you talk about poetry, second layers or something, mm -hmm. deep meanings and all this, of course, you play with words and you know imagine things, and but then if it's tough, but then what is tougher? I think is in the drawings, the pictures, the illustrations. Mm -hmm. I'm not uh, an artist, but uh, sometimes um, you know when you finish reading the the text and then you you pay attention. Usually I don't, but sometimes I I do pay attention to illustrations because they're there. Mm. And then I got uh, upset, you know. It, it doesn't really uh, align with the uh, words, oh. you, know, you know, quite often. Uh -huh. So for you, uh, taking this strategy or, or you know, to, to, to have the words, the pictures in children's form, mm. I don't know if this is a blessing because um, to work out the work, the tax is already a tough job, and then you have to to overcome the the, the, the may, maybe the the lack of um, you know uh, colors and, and lines and, and all this are a, a way of showing, but it's not a very good or efficient tool. Maybe for you, but mm -hmm. to 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 really you know illustrate the deep. The, the different layers of okay. meanings that you read. And then, you know, you have to, at the end, you have to do it again, just to make sure that it matches or, you know, equally with the text. I think that's tough. Mm. Can, can you uh, yeah, elaborate sure. a bit? Um, first of all, uh, I will address your first point. Um, I make no apology for being serious. Mm -hmm. so you are. I am serious. Uh, it's a sort of cast of mind, um, cast of mind, uh, inclination, personal inclination. Um, I like a joke. I hope you pick that up as well. I do like a joke, but uh, fundamentally, I find being alive a very mysterious thing, and um, my response is fundamentally serious. Now. Nobody wants somebody who's going to sort of cast a pall <laughs> over, over all proceedings. So uh, I try to be convivial. I like socializing. I like seeing people. I play a lot of sport. Da, 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 da. I like a joke. But inside all of that, the sort of deep inquiry is of a serious nature. Yeah. Not only serious, sincere. Oh, what a terrible crime. I'm sincere. There are <laughs> There are some quarters of life and the world and some places where the last thing you must be is sincere. Could it be the influence of being raised up in Hong Kong? No, I don't think so. My, generally speaking, my experience of people in Hong Kong is that they are sincere. I am sincere. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I was raised here, then I went to England. When I came back in 1985, I stayed for another 14 years. One of the reasons I stayed is that people were so straight, so sincere, so, uh, and open too. I was delighted. I mean, many people in England are too. Um, but for example, the, the humor in England is, especially amongst young men, for example, I play music with some young guys, and they, they almost never say anything sincere. <laughs> every, every second word is a joke. Bang, bang, joke, 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 joke which is great fun, but I'm also looking for something else. I want both, actually. So that's that. 
pictures and text. Uh, I think the, the, the question you raised, that's part of the reason why adult fiction is not illustrated anymore. In the 19th century, it was, routinely. You imagine the top-selling novelists today, they wouldn't dream of having their work illustrated. Uh, they would consider it a major intrusion on the relationship between author and reader. And I understand that argument. It so happens that um, <clears throat> either I'm illustrating my own books, or for the Folio Society, if I'm il illustrating Gulliver's Travels, it's a world-famous book. It's been famous for nearly 300 years. There are hundreds of editions. If you don't like mine, get another one. So uh, there's room. There's room for illustration. As far as doing my own books goes, uh, having decided it's an illustrated book, I don't sit there agonizing, should there be a picture for this or not? There's a picture. So uh, I do agonize about, uh, shall I do it this way? Shall I do it this way? Shall I put this in or that in? You know, you have to think about all these things. No, no. Generally, the text comes first. The same for writing songs for me. The text generally comes first. Uh, some people do it differently, and occasionally it's the other way around. Um, in principle, I am for illustrating text. Doesn't have to be, but it's okay if it is for me. Okay. Oh, no, no. This, this gentleman first. Okay. Thank you. Uh, before I ask my question, mm. um, I would like to, well, explain myself first. Now, I've actually read um, many books on, on both history and literature, and I noticed actually one thing in common. Whether it's a search, a competition, a battle, of a war, or even forming friendships, everything is basically a conflict. And... Um, so uh, what I'd like to ask is, what kind of conflict did you go through when you, when, when you had the inspiration to write these books? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a deep one. Uh, and we've got five minutes. Uh, okay, here we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> nice question. Um, let's try and go way back and way down. Uh, generally speaking, artists are wounded. And we can go wider. Generally speaking, human beings are wounded. The difference is that the artist takes the motive force of a wound and turns it into art. Um, the wound, broadly speaking, you may say, comes from conflict. How could there not be conflict on this earth. We find ourselves in a very strange world, very wonderful, but people's interests are constantly in conflict. And it comes to violence, sometimes, very often, not always. And uh, even in a relatively civilized environment, there is emotional and intellectual violence. Now, in general, I don't act out of malice. I have rarely acted out of malice. I won't say never, but rarely. But that's not to say that I don't, I make mistakes all the time. I say the wrong thing. I inadvertently <coughs> hurt someone. These things happen all the time. So uh, our job is to try and learn about that and to, to be conscious and to hurt people less. As an artist, um, I don't think we should set out to be wounded and I don't think we should wallow in being woundedness. Oh, poor me, poor me. We shouldn't be doing that. But an awareness that you are wounded can be a force for artistic creation. And I am wounded not terribly badly. There are many people in the world who suffer way more than I do. 
for start, I get, sometimes I get paid to make art. Half, you know, two billion people don't have lunch. And I get paid to make pictures. I mean, you, you can't ask for more than that. So I'm in the sort of 1% luckiest people that not only alive today, but in all history. So with that comes a duty, I consider a duty, to, uh, to try to do positive things in many different ways. Do, we, do you mind if we move on? We're trying to squeeze in. That's a great question. Thank you. Any more? We've got two, two, la to, to two ladies. We'll take, we'll take both. Yeah, two people. Hi, uh, those um, from your talk and looking at the, your illustrations, they seem very clearly to me to be books for adults, mm -hmm. um, but obviously they're for kids as well. What what age children are you? Do you aim them at? And then how do you get into that age group's head space mm. to make it appeal to them too? Right, uh, I don't have kids, so I'm not. I don't have. Uh, I don't have sort of routine home experience of, of what age kids are able to do things. So I'm looking from the outside. But uh, the first one and the second one were my intention with, in agreement with the publisher was that these are for younger children. So either they're reading them themselves or they're being read to. I don't know how many kids get read to these days. It seems to be a diminishing activity. But uh, I guess people still do. Um, so the first two, I, w I was broadly speaking thinking, well, the first one could be five, six. And then uh, it started nudging up. <laughs> um, and by number seven, it's minimum eight. But I mean, you run into this thing with kids' books that uh, a 12-year-old kid is going to think, that's, that's, that's for kiddies. And they won't want to touch it with a barge pole. Um, in general now, it's not my problem, because I'm out of the market, I'm, <laughs> I'm going higher, older. But in principle, I'm still interested. Uh, as a, the, the, the simple, simply expressed story, apparently for a six-year-old, that says other things, I'm still very much interested in. Yeah. Um, my question is, um, what kind of advice would you give to an artist or a writer who are interested in writing stories for children, but with a, you know, like you write, with a deep kind of theme mm -hmm. for adults? Right. First thing is, don't. Go into banking. <laughs> right? Um, I've been freelance all my life, and my living has been precarious all my life, and it still is. It's easier because we don't have kids. If I had children, I would have to change my position. So I can still say, I refuse to do that. I refuse to do that. And I just about get by. So I would warn that the freelance life is precarious. If you are determined which I'm, I'd be very pleased if you are determined, good for you, then uh, don't take my advice. Who am I? Uh, you've got you to figure things out yourself. You have to have a strong, self-driven creative process. You've got to want it. And Having wanted it, you have to put in the hours. You've got to sit down and do it. And many of these pictures take days and days and days, sometimes a week or two. And you get back trouble. And, you know, I mean, there are, there are, there are difficulties. Um, so, yeah, no, no particular advice. I mean, uh, it's hard, but if you're determined, and determined means decades. I've been doing this for 35 years. And it's, I'm still not established. I may die without being established. It's OK by me. It's all right. I'm already lucky. <laughs> you will die that soon. Hi. Thank you. <laughs> the thank last you. Question. The last question. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much, um, Peter. Um, 
I'm so moved by your talk. I've, I've learned so much. Thank you. And, I, and, and, and um, having raised two boys, um, I've read to them, and I think, you know, I think I put you there with, you know, where the wild men are and all those great classics because, you know, you really touch the, the human soul, you know. So I really like, like to thank you very much. I'm really quite moved by, you know, the, oh, the you. trouble you take to think mm -hmm. about, yeah, you know, the things in the world, you know, the, why people get shot down and, you know, that sort of thing. I think the seriousness is important because our world is, is in pain and, and, and in a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a mediator, so I try to deal with conflict every day. Mm. I run a mediation center, um, and I try to resolve conflicts ah. every day. So it's that little bit that I hope I can do after a life of being a barrister, you know, win at all costs. Uh -huh. So I'd really like to thank you for this task that you've given yourself, this gift that you have. And, and I know it's a difficult road with, you know, precarious living, you don't know you know, mm -hmm. what's going to happen, but mm -hmm. I think money isn't everything. But in a consumer society, that's how people here judge success, right? So I think your books have a lot of meaning, and I hope a lot of people will read it. Um, just a quick question is about what time is your talk in PMQ tomorrow? I try to get some friends <laughs> okay. to come Actually, listen I to you. Yeah, All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank, you uh, thank you for your kind thoughts. I appreciate that very much. Um, uh, I have a band, a Hong Kong band called The Box. Uh, rain permitting, we are performing outside the Art Centre at quarter to seven tonight. Yes. Uh, tomorrow I have two talks. You, you should go to see it. He's, Thank you, May. He's really good with Gong Ji Sing together, you know. Fantastic, perfect. Thank you, you know, May. I, I wrote it in the Facebook set. Uh, Peter Schwartz plus Gong Ji Sing yeah. equal to perfect music plus perfect performance. Oh. <laughs> So Thank you, man. you all should go, yeah, really. I'll pay you later, right? <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so we're doing that. And uh, tomorrow I have a talk at 1.30 at the Comics Home Base. In Wachau. You know, uh, Lo Oak, it's in Mao Lo Gai. Yeah. Okay? Uh, Dongman Gai Dei. Yeah. Which is Chinese about... Chinese name uh, is Dongman Gai Dei. One sec. Which is about colour and uh, my experience in Hong Kong as a child. And uh, I'll be talking about some ob objects which I'll be very interested to know if the audience remembers. Uh, that's in Cantonese. Uh, questions afterwards, bilingual. And then the talk about the Folio Society is at PMQ 4.30? 4.30 in the MCCM bookshop. MCCM is Mary Chan, who's yeah, um, publisher. published my books. Publisher for this series of books. For whose support I am very grateful. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, I'm here to do four events. And uh, you, you will also sign books later on. Yeah, I'm gonna. Okay. If anybody wants them signed, I'm happy to do so. Um, uh, so I'd be, be great to see if you'd like to come to the other ones. And uh, thank you all very much. Thank you very much to May. And. Uh, Thank you. Thank you to everybody at the TDC. Thank you very much. And to the British Council. <laughs>